Praise be Jesus and Mary. Now. Today we're going to continue our reflection on the Ten Commandments. We're going to continue again specifically on the Sixth Commandment, which is you shall not commit adultery. I was uh, worried that there might be children here today, but it's a children-free zone because this might be kind of a PG-13 homily, but I think it's, I think it's okay, but it's good uh, if children sometimes maybe don't need to hear everything that adults need to hear. As we've noted before, God's whole teaching on sexuality can be summed up in one phrase. It's you cannot lie against or falsify the truth of love, the nature of love. So truth and love have to go together. To, not, to lie against the nature of love is to sin. To divorce truth from love is actually a counterfeit love. So the love of eros, the love of friendship, the love of affection, all good and of themselves, uh, they all have to be ordered and subordinated to the love of charity, known to the Greeks as agape love or agape love, which is selfless, self-giving love. And how we use our bodies plays a big part in that. You know, we're born into this world pretty much as a paradox in the sense that we're born complete and incomplete at the same time. We're complete in that we are each a unique individual person, human being created in God's image and likeness, the only creature actually willed by God for its own sake, as the Vatican II document Gaudium et Spes says, and yet we are incomplete as well. We find our completeness in communion and in self-donation. We find this naturally in uniting ourselves to another in marriage and creating a family. We find it supernaturally in uniting ourselves to Jesus Christ. In fact, that was actually John Paul II, his favorite quote from the Vatican II documents. It was Gaudium et Spes, number 24, where it says, Man, though he's the only creature on earth willed, which God willed for its own sake, cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. Very beautiful phrase from Gaudium et Spes. It actually echoes our Lord's words from the gospel where Jesus says, he who loses his life, what? Finds it, right? He who loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 10, 39. So the gift of sexuality is an important part of finding our completeness and fulfilling our mission and purpose in life. Sexual activity is more than just pleasure-seeking. It's an intimate, sensible language and a natural sign and a symbol of love. It's a bodily language, but it's also a personal language, too. It's an expression, really, of who you are. The Catechism says at paragraph 2360, sexuality is ordered to the conjugal love between a man and a woman. So sex finds its home in marriage. There's no place like home, as Dorothy would say, right? The home for physical intimacy is the marriage covenant. Sexual activity outside of marriage is spiritually, it's kind of like living on the street or living in the gutter. It's kind of like being homeless in a certain sense. And no one in their heart, heart of hearts really wants to be homeless. In marriage, says the Catechism at paragraph 2360, the physical intimacy of the spouses becomes a sign and a pledge of spiritual communion, unquote. So sexual relations can be experienced as signs of intimacy really only when there's first a spiritual intimacy between the spouses. And as one theologian says, sexual intercourse is intended by God at least implicitly to be a renewal of the faith and the love pledged by that couple when they first entered into their covenant relationship, when they first got married. So every marital act is a memorial, it's a renewal of the couple's total commitment and openness and surrender to each other. Commitment, openness, surrender out of reverence for God and also out of reverence for one another too. Every physical encounter is meant to be a part of the self-donation that was promised and vowed on your wedding day. You might have never thought of that before, right? But that's actually what we promised on our wedding day. It's perhaps one of the reasons why Pope St. John Paul, Pope St. Paul VI, 
In his encyclical Humani Vita, he said in paragraph 11, he said, quote, each conjugal act must remain ordained in itself to the procreating of human life, unquote. So not just some or most conjugal acts, each, meaning everyone, has to be opened to life. He said that principally in referring to contraception, which we'll discuss more in detail in our reflection next week. But implicit in that is that each sexual act in marriage means more than just the physical pleasure that comes from it. There's a sacramentality in marriage that has to be honored and respected. A renewal of our fidelity and openness to our earthly spouse and to our heavenly spouse too. The heavenly spouse is the silent partner in your marriage, by the way. The Jesuit theologian Paul Quay even refers to marital relations as a religious act, a submitting of human choices and desires to God, he said. He actually wrote an essay on contraception and conjugal love in the early 60s that's reprinted in Janet Smith's book, Why Humanity Vitae Was Right. It's actually a really good article, very powerful and prophetic in many ways, if you're interested in reading about that. When sexual activity loses its true purpose and is reduced to pleasure, all expressions of it become permissive. They all become permissible. It's essentially the society that we're living in today. Society of pleasure, but no purpose. No ultimate and intrinsic meaning to human existence. It's actually very sad when you think about it. The reason that the church has or is or has been accused of being so fixated on sex, as they used to say, right, is that sex and love and marriage and family and society and meaning and purpose and God and eternity and heaven and hell, they're actually all intimately united together, right? So you get one of those wrong, you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. The marriage bond is exclusive and perpetual. So exclusive means you and only you. Perpetual means for as long as we both shall live. In that sense, it really is the most romantic, romantic of all loves, right? When you think about it, you and only you for as long as we both shall live. That's very powerful. Sex in marriage is both unitive and procreative. So it's meant to unite the spouses in a profound way. As the two become one flesh, we read that in Genesis 2, 24. It's also meant to bring new life into the world. Since the command by God in Genesis 1, 28 to actually be fruitful and multiply, that's never been revoked. There's no expiration date on that commandment. Well, even technically, it will expire at the end of the world. At the end of the world, it will expire. Until we get there, it's still in play. As part of the marriage covenant, we vow openness to being cooperators with God in creating new life. So we're called to be co-creators with God, just like we're called to be co-redeemers with Christ. When we, as St. Paul, suffer and, quote, complete in our flesh what's lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church, Colossians 1, 24. So co-creators on the one hand, co-redeemers on the other too. This being a cooperator with God in created life, in creating life, is why the marriage is also Trinitarian in its very being. Just as the love of the Father for the Son and the love of the Son for the Father is the source of actually another life, the third divine, third divine person, the Blessed Trinity, the Holy Spirit, so too the love of the husband for his wife, the love of the wife for her husband finds its completeness in bringing forth a new person, a child who is the fruit of their love. We call that the analogy or the similarity between the Trinity and the human family. And it's also why, as we've said in other reflections, why you can't redefine marriage or the family without distorting it. Because the family is a little icon, the family is actually a little image of the blessed Trinity. The unitive and procreative aspect of sexual activity can never be separated without sin being committed. So any marital act that's unnatural or sodomitic or onanistic isn't, or isn't open to life is always a serious grave offense against God. Again, we're talking, talk a little bit more about that maybe in our next reflection on contraception. 
And keeping those two aspects of the marital relations together, the unitive aspect and the procreative aspect, the Catechism speaks about that under the titles of fidelity and fecundity. So two extremes to be avoided regarding marital relations are one, refusing or habitually refusing your spouse without a serious reason. So an overly spiritual or puritanical type of approach to marital relations. That would be violating your marriage vow. It's not what you promised when you got married. And God wants you to keep your promises. The other extreme is using your spouse simply as an object of lust. That's depersonalizing them and degrading for them and for both of you, actually. Remember, virtue is found in the middle of the extremes. Lastly, or almost lastly, chastity is a virtue for everyone, even for married couples, too. In marriage, living chastely includes things like not overindulging in sexual activity, so practicing temperance. You know, just like you can overeat or drink excessively, so too you can be excessive in that area as well. Also, chastity means remembering that the marital act always has to end in a natural way, otherwise it's seriously sinful. Plus, not indulging in masturbation before or after the act. Again, seriously sinful. Separating pleasure from union. It's like separating a fish from water, right? You can do that. You can take the fish out of water, but someone's going to die in the process. You don't separate those two. Lastly, chastity means practicing abstinence when it's wise or necessary to do so. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, 5 even speaks of abstaining at times to be able to devote yourselves more to prayer, which is a very beautiful thing to do. When marital relations are abstained from, that's perhaps the best time to cultivate the other types of intimacy with our spouse that need to be cultivated, namely spiritual intimacy and emotional intimacy too. So connecting more deeply with them on an emotional level and on a shared interests level and on a spiritual level too. That's learning to really love them with a more pure, selfless love. It's learning to see the good in them. It's learning to bring out the good in them. It's learning to love them more as God loves them. If our idea of intimacy with our spouse is only physical or primarily physical, then it's too shallow and it won't last. We need to broaden our understanding of love and not be so superficial in how we relate to each other. Remember, last thing, really the last thing, God doesn't promise us easy, okay? He promises us a beautiful life, doesn't promise us an easy life. Life is beautiful when it's lived in the boundaries that God set up for us, and that includes the boundaries where sexual activity finds its home. So let's ask Our Lady, who's a wife and a mother and a virgin all at the same time, she's the best of both worlds, let's ask her for the grace to be faithful to our vows so that we can be faithful to our spouses and faithful to God as well. Praise be Jesus and Mary, now and forever.